six miles to Chicago. We got a full tank of gas, half a pack of cigarettes. It's dark, and we're wearing sunglasses. Hit it. Take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubble gum. Hail to the king, baby. Welcome, one and all, to the world of Stew. Hello and welcome once again to World of Stew and this happens to be episode 56. Uh, I am of course Stew from World of Stew but it wouldn't be a show without my co-host who is the the man at arms to my Prince Adam. In fact no he's the man at arms to my He-Man. It's Dave. Man at arms I'm trying to remember what on earth the man at arms figure looked like. He was the sort of like the soldier dude with the green helmet, the orange sort of top and the, the tash. Uh, okay, yeah, I'll pass for that. He was quite cool, as long as I'm not going to be the uh, weird female version of He-Man, whatever her name was. She-Ra. She-Ra. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. I'm not going to be She-Ra, that's fine. She-Ra, the princess of power. Oh, uh, yeah. By the power of Grayskull. No, 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 she was wrong. But she was there just to entice girls, wasn't she? Let's be honest. She was. A bit like the... Uh, like the uh, Lady Ghostbusters. Oh, Dave, we will be coming to that shortly. Don't get me started. Okay, sorry, I'm, am I uh, starting a bit early? You are. So let's begin this week's show with the vanilla movie news. Universe. It's the world of Stu news. First up, Dave, sad news. It's been a while. In fact, before this sad news came out, it looked like there was going to be other sad news. Did you see the story about Meatloaf collapsing? I didn't, actually. What happened to Meatloaf? Uh, he was on stage somewhere or other. Bearing in mind he's nearly 70 and he's still carrying a bit of extra poundage, shall we say. And he was in the middle of belting out, I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. And in the middle of it, obviously, people are filming on their mobile phones, which I should point out, people, is against the law. Well, not against the law, but against the rules of the venues. Yeah, but who doesn't record on our mobile phones at a concert? You understand the films, but at a concert, seriously? Well, I've had people who've gone to concerts and said they were distracted by people filming the whole thing through their mobile phones, and they're actually watching it through their mobile phones rather than watching the stage. That is a bit weird, isn't it? Because it's like, well, you've gone to see the concert. Why can't you just enjoy the concert and then watch watch someone else's really fuzzy phone recording of it later on? Well, anyway, so Meatloaf was in the middle of singing that song and then he just went down like a sack of spuds. People in the crowd were like, is this part of the act? And I, at this point, I would be thinking, probably not, because Meatloaf isn't exactly renowned for throwing himself around. Very true, very true. He's uh, he's a bit old for that now as well, isn't he? Yeah, but anyway, it turns out it was just dehydration, so he's fine, okay? But that moves us on to my original point, which is rest in peace to Anton Yelchin. Absolutely, I read this yesterday. It's very tragic, such a young age as well. He is a young actor at the age of 27 who is probably best known as Chekhov in the new Star Trek franchise, Although he was also Kyle, Kyle Reese in the Terminator Salvation. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? Terminator Salvation is not anybody's favourite Terminator film. But, you know, I watched that. And seeing, it as it, seeing him as a young Kyle Reese and the journey he allowed that character to take in that movie, um, I thoroughly believe that he went from young teenager to resistance leader for, uh, in that movie and uh, just shows how talented he was I think at a young age. Speaking of the Star Trek franchise, what's your take on the trailers for the new Star Trek what's the new one called? Is it Into Darkness? 
no, Into Darkness was a previous one. This one is uh, Star Trek. Oh, I'm going to be crucified for this. What's it called? Star Trek Beyond? Uh, Star Trek Beyond, yeah, that's the one. What, what's yeah. your take on the trailer? Oh, it looks it looks okay. I'm not sh- It looks like it's just going to try and be a self-contained Star Trek movie. I've heard a lot of people say, uh, a lot of the makers say, oh, it's just going to ignore the previous one. And so, which, which kind of annoys me in a way. I know the previous one wasn't everyone's cup of tea. It wasn't what a lot of Trekkies wanted. But it was a perfectly decent movie. So, I don't know. The new one looks a bit stylized to me. Maybe it's too much of a good thing already. But uh, we shall wait and see. We shall indeed. But anyway, the whole point of that particular story is rest in peace to young Anton Yelchin, uh, who died tragically as part of a freak accident with his car. A bit like um, the old Brian Harvey. Do you remember that? I do remember that. It was a very bizarre accident. Yeah, where he ran himself over while he was eating burgers or something. Anyway, moving on. Uh, Gary Ross, who was the director of Sea Biscuit and The Hunger Games, has been talking about his new Ocean's Eleven remake with an all-female cast. Uh, it's not actually going to be called Ocean's Eleven. It's going to be called Ocean's Eight. Okay, that's weird. Is it going to be linked to the same films? Is it going to have George Clooney having a cameo? Um, well, he said... And I quote, uh, we're different filmmakers, obviously, so there will be those differences. But one of the things I'm drawn to is the amazing, t- the amazing tone Stephen was able to create. And we discussed that a lot. I'm in no way trying to reinvent the tone, and I'm thrilled and honoured to be extending it. It's really fun to work with. So that, to me, sounds like this might just be a Ghostbusters-esque reboot where they're just supplanting female characters over the top of the male ones and then doing exactly the same film. Okay, yeah. I think we should maybe give these guys a chance. I mean, I maybe it's a reboot, maybe it's a remake, maybe it's going to be kind of in the same universe. Oh, absolutely. I'm going to give it a chance. Don't get me wrong, I'm not slating it. Like, for instance, the Ghostbusters, which we'll get to in a minute. I'm not slating that because they're redoing Ghostbusters. I'm slating that because everything they put out has been crap. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm absolutely. I mean, I think with this New Ocean's 8, uh, I'm more keen to see this than I would be to see an Ocean's 14 with George Clooney, Brad Pitt and Matt Damon. Yeah, well, they kind of jumped the shark there once they had Julia Roberts playing Julia Roberts, but also playing somebody else. Yeah, they did. I mean, don't get me wrong. They were made, they were well-made films. They were a little bit of fun. But by the time Ocean's 13 came round, they were just bad. Moving on to Steven Spielberg news, and Steven has been talking to the press about the potential Indiana Jones 5 that we've been hearing about, and he has confirmed that he refuses to kill off Indiana Jones, despite it being heavily rumoured that this would be Harrison Ford's final appearance. Oh dear, do you know what? I made I made a decision on Sunday. Me and my wife, we're having a big tidy up. And I came upon my Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull DVD. Can I just stop you there? Why do you even own that? Now, well, you know, I I watched it in the cinema. I kind of thought, oh, you know what, that's okay. I've got the box set of the first three. I'm going to have a complete set. You know what that's like, Stu. But, yeah, yeah but you. there's some films that you just can't buy to complete hey, a I've set. I've seen you get a complete set of six versions of the same film not even sequels six versions of the same film that's different of dogs, yeah? six but, six versions of one great film is yeah, completely six different the same film just it's got a, decent, a different cover i thought i'd have a complete set but i finally decided on sunday you know what i'm taking that dvd and put it in my pile of DVDs, pile of dvds to sell or trade in or give away i don't need to have that movie and you know I'm sure there's some completist geeks out there who would say, how dare you, it's part of the Indiana Jones quadrology. Like, no, it's not. It's just not. It's the, the next one may be absolutely amazing, but I'm not having the Crystal Skull anywhere in my collection anymore. Right, speaking of bad films, we might as well get to this now. And I know I said a couple of weeks ago when we covered the plot in detail, the leaked plot of the Ghostbusters film, that... We weren't going to cover it unless something came up. Well, something came up, Dave. Okay. 
I don't know if you've seen this, but nine different TV spots were released on the internet. Nine spots, really? Yeah, nine different TV spots. And there's also been, and I'm not sure how long this has been out, but I only just stumbled across it. There was a sort of a ten minute long video of your chance to meet the individual characters. And it showed some additional footage of each character that you hadn't seen before in any of the trailers. Now, the depressing thing about that is the more footage they show, the more it confirms that the leaked plot is actually true. Yeah, I mean, this is really bad, isn't it? For to have a leak that bad is, uh, is just pretty severe. I mean, this is Sony, isn't it? Right. Now, have you seen any of these TV spots? No, I've been trying to avoid my act, to be honest. Right. Now, I will admit that, as I said before, this has become my obsession, right? Because I'm just... I'm longing, I'm dying for them to release just one tidbit that could prove me wrong. Okay, just one bit. Just just show me one thing that says, OK, I'm going to give you a chance. But let me give you an example of some of the things that you've missed, right, Dave? Right. There's a scene in one of the TV spots where the four Ghostbusters are talking to a police officer after they've obviously just caught a ghost or something. And they're having a discussion about ghosts, and it turns into a joke about the film Ghost, starring Demi Moore and Patrick Swayze. Okay, that's not going to be funny for anyone below the age of 30, is it? Right. And in it, Melissa McCarthy goes, yeah, yeah, we caught the ghost, he stood behind me and we made pottery. That is the level of humour in this film. Okay, yeah. Right, it gets worse though, Dave. It gets worse, right? Because I then watched a TV spot where there is a possessed parade balloon. You know, like the big um, Macy type. Is it Macy's? You know, they're like the big balloon parade things they have in America. Oh, yeah, they have them in New York type thing. Don't they? Yeah, right. Well, one of these balloons that's possessed is of the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. Okay, great. You know, reference to the original. No, no not me. great, Dave. Not great. Do you know why? Why? Because they have made it clear that this has got nothing to do with the original film, right? So right. why in the hell would there be a Stay Puft Marshmallow Man balloon? Um, I don't know. I mean, it could be a reference to the original. It could be just going, hey, we respect the original movie. Is it, is it not that? It, it's, and then it gets worse, right? Because they all fire on this Stay Puft Marshmallow Man balloon and it falls on top of them, right? And we cut to a scene, sort of like looking up through the pavement as if it's clear perspex, right? And you see their faces squash onto the ground, and they're going, this is so not good. That's a bit weird. Right. But it gets worse, Dave. Trust How me. How it get worse? It gets worse, because there is a scene where, and I'm not sure the context of it, but they're obviously discussing ghosts or whatever, and they're playing a reel-to-reel tape, and they're preparing themselves for, like, the ghostly haunting whatever is on this tape. And do you know what's on it? What's on there? A fart sound. Ugh. And I kid you not, it's a fart joke in a Ghostbusters film. See, the original was so great. It was so funny without being just bad. And, you know, I saw the, I saw one of the recent trailers where Melissa McCarthy's Ghostbuster gets a proton accelerator thing and she shoots of a giant ghosty wants it and she shoots it in between the legs and it's like oh I'll take that Ugh. I was like really? yeah she shoots it in the crotch and how is that not sexist? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's sexist it's just I don't, I'm not bothered about it being sexist it's just bad and how does it make any sense because a ghost would not have genitalia well it shouldn't do anyway surely right but it gets worse Dave how how far can we go? right because some of these TV spots open with, like, text at the beginning. You remember the old 30 years ago text and all that malarkey? Well, this time the, oh, yes. this time the text talks about... Um, I don't think it says 30 years ago, but it goes, it was the symbol that defined a generation, which is obviously talking about the Ghostbusters logo. Right? Okay. And it says, it's the symbol that defined a generation is getting an upgrade. And then it cuts straight to the joke, which you've probably seen, of... Um, Chris Hemsworth turning the computer around and he's drawn boobs on the ghost. On the ghost? Yeah, he's drawn a Ghostbusters logo with massive boobs. 
and the women go, oh, oh, can you see how this might be a problem? And he just goes, oh, what well, is it the boobs? I can make them bigger. Well, yeah. Do you know what? I, I thought a while ago, I thought, you know what? I don't want to see Ghostbusters remade, but I would have been happy to see these guys make a different kind of movie. You know, there's all those... You know, there's all those shows where there's paranormal investigators and they go to these sites to and they go to these haunted houses to investigate stuff. I would have, and there's been a lot of movies like that, but horror movies where the investigators have found something really, really bad in the haunted house and they've got stuck in the haunted house because it's possessed or whatever. If they made a comedy version of that with this cast, I'd be like, hey, yay, okay, it's something different. Maybe it could be okay. But to this Ghostbusters is just going to be everyone's modern memory of Ghostbusters now. What they should have done is just called it Ghost Bitches, right? And had done with it, and then everyone wouldn't have got their asses out of shape because they would have gone, oh, it's just Paul Fade doing Ghost Bitches. He's got nothing to do with Ghostbusters. Exactly. Anyway, it seems to me, and I don't know if you agree with this now, with the. Obviously, they filmed the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man bits and all the rest of it, but to stick those bits in the trailers now is almost like they're deliberately trolling us, as if to go, you're complaining, you're complaining, here, have something to complain about. Yeah, I think you're actually right, because I saw um, I saw the cast on, the whole cast on Graham Norton show on the weekend, and the director appeared as well, and, you know, he deliberately said, um, right, we're all in the business now of ruining men's childhoods, I thought all the girls could sing a cappella in a folk lady style Ghostbusters song. <laughs> I see, I haven't seen this. I'm going to have to YouTube this now. Yeah, and you know what? I wouldn't, I've, I've you know, seen a lot of girls sing a cappella recently. You know, we've all seen Pitch Perfect. And, you know, I actually really like both those movies. Maybe it's just the uh, young teenage girl in me. Uh, whatever. Um, <laughs> that could sound so I, wrong. I didn't say that. That's kind of weird. But... Um, right, maybe it's the camp man in me. I don't know, but I. But this. But again, this was just bad. It was a bad little version of. You guys are supposed to be funny. You know, get me Victoria Wood. Get you know, she'd be in Ghostbusters. I'm sure she could she be would. a ghost. Yeah, sorry if anyone feels that's in bad taste, but <laughs> Victoria Wood was a talent of a generation. She was a generally funny woman. She could. Right the ass of these guys easily and you know she was a generally funny person get rid of these guys and they're just not funny sorry they're not well needless to say uh, pretty much across the board every tv spot on youtube has more down votes than up votes and going back to the first official trailer that they released the current figures stand at 251,313 likes and 875,240 dislikes Yowch, I'm just waiting for that to get to a million, that'd be classic. I don't, I don't think it, I don't think it'll get to a million before the film comes out, but if the film comes out and it's as bad as everyone thinks it's going to be, everyone might go back on there and start voting for it again. Unfortunately, you can only vote for it once, I've discovered. Oh, that's a bit of a shame. Yeah. Right, so let's move away from Ghostbusters, because frankly I'm sick of talking about it, and it is out in, what are we on today, the 20th? So, 25 days from now. It is released. 25 days, that's not much at all. It isn't at all. So let's talk about films that are out now. And Finding Dory has set a few records in its opening weekend. It has the new opening weekend record for an animated film at 136.2 million. Uh, this is just in America. Um, it has a per screen average of 31,634, which is a new record. And its opening day take in America was $54.9 million, which was yet another record. Um, it is also raked in, at the time, $50 million internationally. Um, and it has usurped, in all those records I just mentioned, Shrek the Third. Oh, OK. And Shrek the Third wasn't that great either. But, yeah, this is um, quite a result for Pixar, isn't it? I mean, they just seem to be going from strength to strength at the moment. Well, I did read somewhere that... Um, Disney have like absolutely smashed it in the box office this year. They've taken some ridiculous figure like in the billions because of all the films they've had out. Yeah, so remind me what they had. What they had this year? They've had Zootopia, 
Yeah, and obviously they've had Finding Dory, Civil War, uh, Jungle Book. Um, uh, they did have the good dinosaurs out this year, though that didn't take a lot, did it? They kind of tanked a little bit, yeah, but they are basically smashing it at the moment because everybody is loving themselves a bit of the Disney franchise. Well, just go, just go to show, you know, they're worth it. I mean, I think um, when we talk about the Marvel movies as well, they've clearly... They've clearly got their act together. They know what they're doing in terms of the Marvel movies, making them fan, make, make them all friendly, friendly, family friendly and accessible. And you know what? It's been a while since I've watched a bad Pixar movie as well. Like I said I haven't watched Good Dinosaur. So now speaking of uh, Disney, as we were there, let's switch from the franchises we just mentioned to Star Wars. Now, obviously, Star Wars Rogue One is out later this year, and then Star Wars Eight is out next year. Is that right? I think that's right. I'm not sure if Star Wars 8, I read it somewhere that they did change the release date somewhere from there. Uh, but, but I'd have to check online to what they changed the release date to. It should still be 2017, I think. Right. Now, obviously we spoke about this a few weeks ago. And we mentioned that somebody had leaked a potential plot spoiler that uh, Ray was the reincarnation of Anakin Skywalker, yeah? Do you remember that? Yeah, that did sound pretty ridiculous. And there was a line that this person claimed where she goes to Luke, I am your father, which would have been all kinds of terrible. Well, there's been a new set of uh, alleged spoilers leaked, which make a little bit more sense, but don't really sound like it would be something they'd have in a Star Wars film. Now, if, if if you'll permit me, I will share these with you and you can give me your feedback. Okay, go ahead. Right. Um, Now, apparently, this involves leaked script pages which show a conversation which takes place between Luke Skywalker, Rey, and Yoda. Yoda? Would that be Yoda's ghost? Uh, Probably, yeah. Now, apparently, Rey has another vision which shows the history of the Jedi Order. Apparently, Jedi are arrogant and they hide a secret that leads to their eventual demise. Uh, Luke shows Rey a vision of a tree on an alien planet under which a boy and a girl are playing. As the boy nears the tree, he grows strong and he gets intuition. He also becomes full of hate. After some time, the boy kills the girl and he then touches the tree and becomes possessed before killing his parents and fleeing the planet. However, unbeknownst to the boy Dave, the girl has survived and is also transformed by the tree. She then begins the Jedi Order. This girl then gets followers and tells them that when she dies, she will be reincarnated. Luke tells Rey that the Order has been searching for the One, (coughs) Matrix, uh, since the girl's death. This is thought to be Anakin, but nope, I'm afraid not, because he was a little bit mental. Uh, At this point, it's unclear whether Rey or Kylo Ren will eventually end up being the One, (coughs) Matrix ripoff. Now, the little bit of the tree tree there, that sounds believable because if you go back to the whole empire uh the empire strikes back where luke goes into this little underground bit or into a tree they're supposed to be places places which are strong in the force where um in some of the star wars mythos you can go and you can kind of you can have visions you can almost it almost makes you stronger as well so that could be believable a little bit the twins and family that sounds Star Warsy, but the boy killing his family as well. And, you know, we will... All this stuff with the one as well. I think they saw that out already, that yes, Anakin was the one, but other Star Wars fans may correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm misremembering, but I'm sure the prophecy was there will be someone strong with the Force who will bring balance to the Force. It doesn't say he'll bring peace. It says he will bring balance. And he does. He basically leaves it. So there's one Jedi and one Sith. (laughs) Because he kills all the rest of the Jedi, including the children. But um, I think that's the problem. It's not a one as in we're looking for the one who is good and brilliant and great. It's the one who will bring balance. Is that Luke? Was that Anakin? Who knows? Imagine if they ever won and they cast Keanu Reeves. That'd be great. I'd love, I'd love to see Keanu Reeves as a Jedi. Uh, not as a Neo-type Jedi, but oh, 
you know, he is capable of good stuff. Just watch. Have you watched Jonathan Wick yet? I haven't, no, Dave, because I refuse to watch anything with Keanu Reeves in it after that god awful, was it Knock Knock? That I, watched. I understand. I understand that's bad. Everyone's in bad films every Have you seen that yet? No, I haven't. You have to watch that film, Dave. I don't care if you have to download it or rent it or whatever. You have to watch that film before you can comprehend just how bad it actually is. Okay, do your do, Ned. Fine, next week, you watch John Wick, John Wick, and I shall watch Knock Knock, and we both see. Um, we both tell each other what we think. Okay, fair enough. Uh, moving on to our final vanilla news story. It's not really movie-based, but it is kind of. But anyway, Space Ghost Productions and Studio Chanel, or Canal, depending on how you want to pronounce it, are teaming up to release a board game based on 1987's Evil Dead 2. A board game based on Evil Dead? Yeah, and the what? game is going to be funded through Kickstarter. Uh, there will be a standard and a deluxe edition of the game, and uh, for obviously for various amounts that you donate and the, the the games will feature at least eight custom figures and art depicting characters and monsters two to six players will work together in 60 to 90 minute sessions to collect the pages of the necronomicon ex mortis whilst fighting demons and deadites uh, apparently six lucky fans will also get a chance to have their likeness drawn into the game or a future evil dead 2 comic book okay i'm gonna have to get over to kickstarter which is an awesome website, by the way. I don't know if you've ever visited before, but it is a truly great opportunity to get some unique products. Well, I, I should just point out, this isn't released yet, but it is coming on Kickstarter. Their Kickstarter hasn't started yet, but it will be there shortly. Okay, I'll, I should have to look at that very shortly and see how much it is, because I know the way Kickstarter works is you donate the money, and then, as far as I remember, if it... If the product comes off, if they get their money, you get the product. But if the pro- if they if they don't get all the money they're looking for in a Dragon's Den style way, you don't have to donate the money. So you only donate the money if they raise everything they're looking for. If that makes sense. It does indeed. Yep. So we will be looking forward to that, and uh, I shall be buying one as well. So that was the end of the vanilla movie news, which means it must be time for the superhero news. Right, where do we begin this week, Dave? Well, we start with Spider-Man Homecoming, right? Now, we all know that Michael Keaton is going to play the lead villain in Homecoming, right? Which is awesome. Yeah. Um, but we yet, as yet, don't know who he's playing. Um, it appears, however, that another evildoer will be played by Logan Marshall Green. Uh, Green is known as Quarry in the TV show of the same name, Quarry, and Charlie Holloway. He played Charlie Holloway in Prometheus. Charlie Holloway in Prometheus. Uh, I think I remember that guy. Yeah. You, yeah, but the fact that you can't really picture him. Kind of sense, uh, but apparently there's going to be more than one villain in Spider-Man: Homecoming. So, okay, I don't, you know, I don't mind movies where there's more than one villain. Obviously, what I do mind is movies like Spider-Man Three, where they have a really incredible villain and they don't do it justice. So, I'd rather they had one villain and did it well than two villains and did it kind of in a half-assed way. So I'm going to have to wait and see who we are, but if, if Marvel Studios are kind of behind this as well, I'm, you know, I've got faith it'll be good. Speaking of half-assed, uh, Jenna Malone, who has starred in the Hunger Games series and Sucker Punch, uh, was rumoured to be playing Barbara Gordon in the extended cut of Batfleck vs. Superville. It turns out that she's actually playing a character called Jeanette Kilburn. Have you ever heard of her? Jeanette Kilburn? Um, who's she? Uh, I'm not surprised you haven't, because she is apparently a lead scientist at Star Labs and is an ally to Superman. Uh, will her brief appearance in this film lead to a bigger role, and who really cares? Yeah, well, that's the thing. If they, if they cast her and she was edited out, 
they can't have much faith in her role going forward for the future, surely. Well, the thing is, Star Labs has already been done amazingly well in the Flash TV series. So anything they do in the DCEU, bearing in mind they're having a new Flash, they're not having the same actors and so on, is going to be a letdown. Yeah, okay, I've been hearing good things about the Flash, by the way. Uh, yeah, it's excellent, and we will get to that shortly because I want to mention The Flash. But before that, and this isn't movie-based as such, but it's still about Batfleck versus Superville, a woman in Kroger in the US went to her local bakery to collect a Batman versus Superman birthday cake for her child's party. Upon seeing the cake and hating it, uh, she tried to get behind the counter to fix it. When this didn't work, she drop-kicked the cake all over the shop for steaming, storming out and screaming, they fucking ruined my seven-year-old's birthday cake. <laughs> okay, you know what people do get passionate about their kids, don't they? <laughs> See, when I read it, now obviously drop kicked me, and she dropped it to the floor and kicked it as it fell down. But I just imagined, uh, it's obviously the wrestling fan in me, that it was on a counter somewhere and she flew out it, Jeff Hardy style, and drop kicked it. That would be fantastic, wouldn't it? That would. Unfortunately, the shop has no. Yeah, the shop doesn't have any security cameras, so there's no footage of it. Oh, shame. Moving away from the DCEU, back over to Disney, or Marvel. Uh, Civil War is the first film of 2016 to take $400 million in the US. Its global take is now at $1.14 billion. Wow, so it's well and truly over a billion. Yep. Uh, it's, so it's, U it's taken the US, it's pretty much what X-Men Apocalypse has taken worldwide. Uh, yeah, X-Men Apocalypse I think has just passed the half a billion mark, 521 or something? Okay, not too far off. X-Men Apocalypse is a bit over I guess, but yeah, still not great for X-Men Apocalypse, is it though? Uh, it's not, although obviously it's probably taken enough money to justify another film. Yeah, I think so. Do you know what film I want to see? I want to see them just skip another X-Men film. I just want to see X-Force. That's, that's not going to happen, is it? Let's be honest. It's probably not going to happen, but, you know, that's that's my wish. You know, obviously that's a, di a discussion for a different day, but I want to see X, X I want to see the X-Force movie. Okay, fair enough. Right, now, I mentioned The Flash a little while ago there, the TV show, and I wanted to go back to that, but before... I cover the flash i wanted to talk about the supergirl tv show have you seen any of that i as uh, i think i mentioned a long time ago i've watched a pilot and i really enjoyed it so i'm just waiting for a chance to kind of sit down and watch the whole what and watch the actual series because i was actually quite impressed i thought it was just you know fun right okay now i will admit when i heard that there was a supergirl tv show and i saw the trailer i thought this is just going to be Ugly Betty in capes. You know what? I think I think I could forgive you for that because I was kind of thinking the same thing. I saw the trailer and I thought uh, this just looks like um, you know a TV series for girls. I'm not interested. Right. But then the pilot blew me away. But I will admit I was pleasantly surprised, and I have watched the entire series. Okay. All right. Now I won't go into too much detail because you haven't seen it yet, and I don't want to spoil too much for you. But the two-part finale of this show completely undid all the great work they did in the entire series. Oh, did it really? That's, <laughs> that must be pretty bad. Okay, because there's this whole plan where there's this thing that's going to happen, right? And again, I won't go into it, but this thing that happens affects Superman, right? But, okay. and it also affects all humans, but it doesn't affect Supergirl. Now, the way that this is explained is that Supergirl is actually more powerful than Superman, Right, and that Superman is more human than Supergirl because he's been on the planet longer, which is just lame. That just makes no sense whatsoever. But that's complete opposite to what we understand so far about Kryptonian. It's like, but if you've been on Earth longer and you're a Kryptonian you've had longer to absorb the sun's energy, right? Yeah, right, and it gets worse, okay? Right, because I'm of the understanding, I'm not a big Superman fan, but Superman can fly in space. Yeah, definitely. Right, Christopher Reeve, he flew in space. I watched him do it. And, and, and Henry, Henry Cavill did it in uh, Dawn of Justice. And in this particular episode, 
the final episode, Supergirl goes, oh, I wish my cousin was here, and where is he? And somebody tells her, oh, he's off planet at the moment doing some other work. So he's in space, right? Okay. But the end of this series involves Supergirl having to do something that puts her in space. Okay, and, it shouldn't be a problem, right? And it's revealed that if she does this, she will die because there's no atmosphere for her to fly in and she can't breathe, so she'll be dead. Oh, that, this, that stuff like that makes me so angry. Do you know what <laughs> Have the have the people who wrote this show seen the team seen all the other Superman stuff? Right, it gets worse though, Dave. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I've said that a lot tonight because she goes up into space to sacrifice herself for the greater good, and before she does this, she has a sort of comms communication with her half sister, sort of thing. The the Earthling who's her half sister, right? They've lived together, they've grown up, blah blah blah. And she basically tells... There's literally three minutes for Supergirl to do what she has to do to save the planet, right? Okay. So she has this conversation, and her sister's all like, Oh, I'm going to die. And Supergirl's all like, Don't worry, I'm going to go up into space and save everyone. Three minutes, right, Dave? Okay. Okay. So Supergirl does what she has to do, yeah? And then she's up in space, and she's about to die. So... This is less than three minutes later, okay? Obviously, because, you know, otherwise it would have happened and Earth would have been done for. Yeah? Yeah, naturally. All of a sudden, her Kryptonian pod that she arrived on Earth in comes flying by and collects her, and it's being piloted by her half-sister, the human, who has never flown it before in her life. Okay, so she just had time to just go get it, did she? Oh, no, it was in the same building that where she was, but in less than three minutes, she's made her way to it, got in it, learned how to fly it, and then taken it up into space, got Supergirl, and taken her back to Earth. Okay, that's just daft. Right, and the reason why this annoyed me so much was because all the other shows that I've been watching, superhero shows, like The Flash, for instance, The Flash season two finished with a massive teaser for the potential of season three being all about the flashpoint paradox okay cool and dc's legends of tomorrow ended with the introduction of rex tyler who is from the justice society of america so it leaves all these questions of what time does he come from who is he the justice society of america has never been mentioned it's all about time travel so those two shows just have massive endings that make you want to watch the next season Supergirl I don't want to see another episode of it in my life <laughs> Is, but if he, how many episodes in the season was it? was it uh, 12, 24? It was like, no, it was, both of those were really weird because DC Legends of Tomorrow had 16 and Supergirl had like 18 or something which is random because normally it's 23 yeah, normally it's 23 or 24 for an American series, isn't it? I mean, I know in the UK quite often we only do 10 or 12 or something like that, but that is, yeah, that's a random number. So, yeah, I was not impressed with the end of Supergirl, so damn you, you I've lost another show. You know, I'm going to have to watch it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to watch it. I've yet to get time to... If I could just freeze time in a kind of, I don't know, X-Men-like bubble with my new mutant power... I would have to just sit down and watch Arrow, Flash, and Supergirl because they're free. Oh, and pro- probably Legends of Tomorrow as well because there are a whole bunch of series I have not had the time to watch. And finally, in this week's superhero news, Batman Rebirth. Yes, Batman Rebirth. I I haven't read Batman Rebirth yet. Well, I haven't. I haven't read it either. But um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on the introduction of two new characters uh, called Gotham and Gotham Girl, both of whom have Superman-esque powers. Superman-esque powers? That's they can fly and stuff, yeah. Okay, so, you know what, I'm never a big fan of them introducing more characters to the Batman world, though. I always kind of feel like Batman is... I feel like the fewer characters Batman has around him, the better he is. But I don't feel like he needs too many allies. Is that, just, is that just weird? Is that just me? Well, Batman 
by proxy is technically a loner, isn't he? Although, he is, yeah. obviously in recent years, he's basically got himself an entire Bat family. He has, it's just ridiculous. You know, Gotham must be so full of vigilantes and... Um, How is there any crime in Gotham anymore? It, it does make you wonder, isn't it? You know, what have we got now? We've got Batman, we've got Nightwing, we've got Robin, we've got the son of Robin... Uh, the son of Robin? Uh, Damien, the uh, son of Batman, sorry. Uh, Damien Wayne. Yeah, you've got Red Robin, you've got uh, Red Hood, you've got Batgirl, you've got... Oh, there's just... There's hundreds of them. There's officially Batwoman now as well. Yeah, so... Yeah, but, so it'd be interesting to see where these two new superpowered heroes are going to fit into the whole thing. It will, won't it? You know, I, I do worry that the more... This was my worry about the Joker we mentioned a few weeks ago, that if they're saying there are three Jokers, does that dilute the character a little bit to say there's three of him? Does that make him less dangerous, or does that lessen the mythos around Joker? Just as it might do... Just as I... This is how I feel about Batman. I feel that the more of these characters you introduce to surround Batman, the less powerful the the icon of Batman is, because that's what I feel Batman Batman is. He's an icon. He doesn't need all these sidekicks. Uh, That was this week's Superhero News. Just in closing, um, 508,385,833 is X-Men Apocalypse's global take. No, that's not too bad, is it? That's made that's made them a lot of money, but I doubt the studio will be seeing that as a success. No. Now we do this every now and again, Dave. I just want to quickly touch upon the latest WWE news. Um, we don't cover it every week because you know we don't want to go into the ins and outs, the feuds, and talk about matches each and every week. But there's been a couple of stories. Uh, did you see the Jerry Lawler story? I didn't see a Jerry Lawler story. What's happening there? Uh, now, if you remember, a few weeks ago, Adam Rose was suspended first for a wellness policy violation. And then while he was under suspension, he was arrested for domestic disturbance, domestic abuse. Uh, and that prompted the company to let him go. OK, that's fair enough, I feel. Well, Jerry Lawler has now been suspended following a domestic disturbance. Um... Basically, he was arrested, as was his young girlfriend, because obviously we know the king likes him some young puppies, and uh, allegedly, and um, there was a gun involved and stuff, so the WWE have suspended him. You know what? That is fair. You know what? You can't suspend one person and then not another if it's the same kind of thing, can you? Although, of course, it doesn't really matter, because Jerry always finds his way back. I remember when he quit back in the day when they fired his... Misses at the time, the cat. Do you remember the cat? Uh, yes, I do, yeah. She got her boobies out. Well, you know what he was always saying on the TV, that love puppies. Yeah, so uh, he quit when they fired her, but then they ended up getting a divorce and back he went. Uh, speaking of old wrestlers, have you seen this? Um, you remember we were talking about the brand split a few weeks ago and you were worried that there wasn't enough talent to fill two rosters? Yeah, I still feel the same way. Well, technically three rosters because you've got NXT as well. Well, I had a quick look at the current WWE website. Now, obviously, some of the wrestlers that are on the website are out injured. Long term, short term, you know, uh, Tyson Kidd, for instance. Some of them are part-timers like The Undertaker, Brock Lesnar and so on. But there's currently 60 wrestlers uh, listed on the current roster for the WWE. So if you were to split that in half... That would be 30 on each show. Does that not sound like enough to you? Yeah, but if you've got 30 on each show, now, if you have, you know, how many good tag teams have they got at the moment? Maybe four, five at a stretch? Is there just going to be one show for the tag teams? Well, who, I wouldn't imagine they're going to have two sets of tag titles. That would be a bit of oversaturation, really, wouldn't it? It would, wouldn't it? Well, anyway, uh, the WWE obviously agrees with you because they have been contacting former talent about the possibility of returning to the company to fill out the roster for either Raw or Smackdown. Uh, names that have been contacted apparently are Kurt Angle. Isn't he with TNA? Uh, no, he left TNA. He's kind of independent contractor. Well, they're all independent contractors, but he's kind of an indie guy at the moment. Okay, you know, I'd love to see Kurt Angle back. I'm, you know, I'm not 
I haven't seen too many of his matches recently, so I don't know what kind of condition he is. But just dream match wise, um, Seth Rollins versus Kurt Angle, Kurt Angle versus Dean Ambrose, you could have some decent matches. I think I'd rather just see Kurt Angle come back as a sort of a mentor for a young tag team, maybe like the American Alphas. Yeah, I'd love to. Likewise, again, he's you know Kurt Angle's a great talent, isn't he? He could be on the mic, he could wrestle just for the occasional match. I imagine he could get a lucrative deal. Right. With WWE. Jeff Hardy. No. <laughs> just put it away, man. Leave him out of it. He's not worth coming back. Uh, well, he has stated that he wants to finish his career in the WWE. And he wants to top what Shane McMahon did in the Hell in the Cell at WrestleMania. Oh, fantastic. What are you going to do? Just jump off the top of the stadium? Into a bath of acid. Yeah, jump off the stadium into a bath of acid and then be buried alive under giant breeze blocks. Yeah. Actually, yeah, come back, Jeff. That sounds great. Uh, Carlito. Uh, he was an alright wrestler, wasn't he? MVP. Mm, not so keen on MVP. Stevie Richards. Uh, he was he was a pretty good wrestler in ECW, wasn't he? But I think WWE never really used him very well. And Goldberg. Yeah, anyone who anyone who destroyed Bret Hart's career can go take a flying jump. <laughs> uh, but what I don't understand is right now the WWE recently, whether the wrestlers asked for their release or they didn't, let go. Cody Rhodes and Damian Sandai, right? Two great wrestlers. Now, they must have known that they were going to do the brand split when they released those two. So, did those two wrestlers know that there was going to be a brand split and knew that the WWE was going to bring in all these big names so they would never get out of the mid-card anyway? Or did the WWE know there was going to be a brand split and just went, you guys want to leave, screw you, we're not going to tell you? Um... I think that, to be honest, looking at someone like Cody Rhodes, I can understand his frustration because he's a really good wrestler. He did some incredible job with the Intercontinental title on numerous occasions. He was able to take countless ideas and just get a lot of heat in the ring. But they haven't done anything with him for a good few years. So, you know, what, how, is, how would the brand split change that? So I can understand him going. Uh, Damien Sando, likewise, he's a good wrestler. He's had a few pushes. But uh, Adam Rose, did you watch him wrestle at all? Was he any good? Uh, no, uh, he had this party gimmick where everyone came out and there was like a big party and he had like a mascot who was a bunny and it was just like, yeah, just go away. Yeah, just not a good, just not a good idea. Then. Well, it was one of those gimmicks that worked really well in NXT because obviously NXT is a more passionate, smarky crowd. Um, but when it went up to the main roster, it kind of was entertaining for about five minutes and then died on its arse. Okay, fair enough. And finally, in our WWE news, uh, last night, of course, was Money in the Bank. A uh, pretty average card, nothing really interesting happened. AJ Styles beat John Cena, but he needed help. Um, Kevin Owens, how he is walking, I have no idea, after this ridiculous spot that he took on a ladder. Uh, you haven't seen that, have you? I haven't seen that. I did watch, um, I did notice, though, the, the tag team match. I was actually quite happy that the New Day managed to retain their titles, even though there was one spot in the start of the match where the ref clearly, uh, one of the border villains was covering someone, and he clearly counted to three before someone, while someone missed their spot, on pulling someone else out of the ring. So, yeah, the crowd seemed a bit like, what? But they clearly didn't care because New Day, New Day kept the title. And, you know, it's good, isn't it? Someone like, a team like the New Day, champions for 300 plus days now? Well, this um, ladder spot with Kevin Owens, you know when a ladder is led down flat? Yeah. Right, so, and then they body slam wrestlers on top of it and you're like, that's got to work. Yes. Well, this ladder was led down, but it was on its side, right? Okay. And somebody body slammed Kevin Owens onto that back first. Oh. Yeah, you have to look it up on YouTube or whatever, um, or, of course, subscribe to the WWE Network. Um, but it was a sick bump, and everyone just went, oh, my God, 
have they just crippled Kevin Owens? Yeah, because he took a pretty bad bump at WrestleMania as well, didn't he? He did, and he walked away from that as well. The man is obviously made of John Cena steel. You know what, he's, he's a guy that deserves the belt at some point. Um, talking of which, I was really surprised in the main event. Yeah, I was going to get to that, right? The, okay, sorry. The, no, 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 not at all. Uh, the main event was obviously Roman Reigns, the guy, uh, defending the title against his former S.H.I.E.L.D. comrade. Seth Rollins, or we should just point out that the third member of the Shield, Dean Ambrose, won the Money in the Bank ladder match. Uh, Seth Rollins beat Roman Reigns clean, which was very bizarre. He did. Now, do you think that because there was a referee bump, wasn't there? Mm Mm-hmm. And um, there was a referee bump, and so this was clearly just like John Cena earlier on. We're supposed to think John Cena clearly should have beaten AJ Styles clean, but the referee was out. Exactly the same happened in the main event, where Roman Reigns was clearly, could have beaten Seth Rollins clean if the referee hadn't have taken the bump. Right? Right. So, you know, that's all the, all the people who are thinking, you know, Roman Reigns is a great baby face and the guy. Thinking, oh, Roman Reigns got cheated out of the title, he should have beaten Seth Rollins. But then Roman Reigns took this bizarre bump out of the ring, outside the ring, didn't he? Uh, I, don't, I don't know, I haven't seen the match, so I'll take your word for that. Well, um, towards the end of the match, just after referee bump, I think it was, Roman Re- uh, Seth Rollins got out of the ring and was kind of supposed to be um, wander, uh, wandering around, kind of looking a bit like the cowardly heel, like he didn't want to wrestle anymore. Roman Reigns got out of the ring, ran around the side of the ring to do a spear, but charged straight through, um, just charged straight through the ringside barrier. And so the referee gets out, he calls the doctor down, the doctor's looking at Roman Reigns, and Seth Rollins just kind of stood there for a good minute, maybe two minutes, kind of looking at him like, is he okay? Is he okay? while Roman Reigns kind of stumbles around a little bit. And I'm thinking, is this just bad booking again? They're making him look weak. He should be, you know, he's supposed to be the big good guy, isn't he? Who, Roman Reigns? Yeah, Roman Reigns. Yeah. Even though he's been, he wrestled like a heel, I have to say. Well, that's wrestled. because everybody hates him. Yeah, and he was getting serious boos, by the way. But Seth Rollins was getting far more cheers. So, yeah, and then... And then Seth Rollins chucked him in the ring again. Um, uh, jumped on him, chucked him in the ring. Um, I think he gave him a pedigree. And then he he actually did quite a sick reversal of a pedigree where Roman Reigns charged across the ring to do a spear. Seth Rollins jumped up and kind of turned it into a pedigree in midair. Nice. You know, a, a absolutely awesome reversal. And of course... That's a pedigree in midair, right? Who's going to kick out from that? <laughs> Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns kicks out from that. Well, and, of course, none yeah. of this actually matters because Seth Rollins beat Roman Reigns and then out with his briefcase comes Dean Ambrose, cashes in, and he wins the title. He does. And you know what? He deserves it. He's been such a... As far as the WWE's wrestling is concerned, this guy has been working solid for this title for how many years now? See, now I'm surprised that you say that because I don't really get the love for Dean Ambrose. You know, okay, I think he's, if you look at him as a character, it's a bit like, okay, he's not he's not quite Stone Cold, he's not quite Roddy Piper, he's not quite Brian Pillman, but he's got a bit of all those characters in there, and he's a solid, solid wrestler as well. So, you know, he's not as good as AJ Styles as a wrestler or as good as, um, who else would you say, uh, Kurt Angle as a wrestler. He's not as dominant as Brock Lesnar, but he's a good, solid worker. And I think in the next couple of years of his career, maybe he deserves a championship or two. And this, of course, is leading, obviously, to a Shield triple main event. Yeah, let's face it. We know that... SummerSlam is going to be the Shield all against each other, isn't it, for the title? Yeah, so you're quite happy that Dean Ambrose has got the belt? 
I'm happy that he's got the title. Do you know what? I'd happily have to see it on him or Seth Rollins. Because, do you know what? Seth, this was Seth Rollins' first match for, what, eight months? Yeah. And, you know, he's clearly still got the moves. You know, there, there are a few missed spots. And, you know, overall, during the night, I spotted a lot of the wrestlers mumbling to each other about what moves to do next. Um, John Cena especially. And John Cena's always doing that. Yeah. If you watch, um, just... if you watch Botchamania, they're forever showing John Cena calling spots. Yeah, and it is awful. It's just not impressive. And I saw one or two spots where John Cena would miss something and um, AJ Styles, being a great improviser, would just like a click of his fingers, just move into another, another move and improvise. Uh, AJ Styles, and, and actually I'm really unimpressed at the end of that match as well, because it was, that match deserves better than to have you know, two henchmen run in and get the pin for him. So that was our look at the WWE. Uh, now, up next, we haven't done this in a while, but I believe on 2 Nilla. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. You are two nil up. That's right. Yeah. So you won the first contest where it was me versus you, ten uh, four in the end. It was in. Tell me he didn't just say that. I'm currently two nil up. It's back. It's round three of Dave testing me on. Tell me he didn't just say that. Changed it up slightly this week. Instead of tell me, didn't tell me he just didn't say that from movies. We've got quotes from the world of wrestling. Okay, fire away. So, the first quote, and it's going to take a lot for me not to try and do the impressions here. <laughs> so, I'm just going to just try and say it normally. I have balls the size of grapefruits, and come this Sunday, you'll be spitting out the seeds. Was that The Rock, Dwayne Johnson? Was it Stone Cold Steve Austin? Or was it Vincent K. McMahon? Oh, I knew that as soon as you said grapefruits, mate. It was Vincent Kennedy McMahon. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, that was Vincent McMahon. Okay, one nil to me. Quote number two. Okay, quote number two. Uh, I think I've chosen the wrong subject for this, haven't I? Quote number two. We're going old school here. You don't have to yell at me, Tony. I'm not blind. Was that Jerry Lawler? Was it Bobby Heenan? Or was it Gorilla Monsoon? Uh, That would have been Bobby Heenan. (sighs) And that would have... Do you know why I got that? How did you get that? Because you said, there's no need to yell at me, Tony. And I don't remember Tony Schiavone in his brief time in the WWE, working with either of the other two. But I do remember him working in WCW a lot with Bobby Heenan. Okay, yeah, you used it, yeah, good sense of logic there. Okay, you must have worked with Gorilla Monsoon at some point, surely. Uh, possibly, but that's not a sort of Gorilla Monsoon line, is it? No, it's not really. Is it? That, is typ- that is typical Bobby Heenan, the legend that he is. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, have you seen recent video footage of the man? I have, it's kind of heartbreaking, but he is still so cool. It is harrowing. Um, So I have won, 2 0, but uh, let's go for quote number three. Uh, Quote number three, kind of my last, kind of my favourite one. I'm going to try to try and do my impression in this one, okay? Okay. Because it's probably going to be quite obvious, and you won anyway. I was sent in a capsule for a place not from here. (laughs) And I came here for one reason to attack and keep coming, not to ask, but just to give. Not to want, but just to send. Um, would you have happened to have delivered that line after picking your fat ass up off the floor? Possibly. <laughs> and would you be known as Fred Otterman, formerly known as Tugboat? 
No. Mm. Because, no. Because you are the shop master. No. You got it wrong. Okay, who is it then? Okay, uh, I'll give you a choice. What was that? Jake the Snake Roberts, Gold Dust, or the Ultimate Warrior? Okay, in that case, I mean, I'll give you the point anyway, because I did say Shockmaster, but in that case, it's the Ultimate Warrior. It is the Ultimate Warrior, just one of the crazy examples of the Ultimate Warrior's promos. Can I just say that your impression actually sounded like the Shockmaster? Did it? It did, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, I've, I've actually got a great list of Ultimate Warrior quotes here. If you just look up on the internet some of the Ultimate Warrior quotes, and, you know, he's just... He was just crazy, and, you know, we're not going to see his like again, unfortunately. So, I am currently now 3 nil up in Tell Me. He didn't just say that. I am going to have to make it much more difficult, aren't I? You are. Now, before we get to the way we always close this show, which is Dave's Week of Geek, it is the return of another feature. And we've only done this once before, um, and I still haven't got a jingle or any music for it, but it's MEF. MEF. Yeah, which, of course, stands for Movie Events Through History. And this Ooh, okay, being... Cool. Sorry? Okay, cool. Yeah, I just completely forgot what we used to do. We've done this. Yeah. Uh, so today is June the 20th. So these are events that happened on June the 20th, in the history of movies. In 1887, Chon Wang and Roy O'Bannon thwart Lord Nelson Rathbone and Wu Chow's plot to assassinate Queen Victoria and nine members of the royal family. What film's that from? Is that from Victoria? Uh, what? Victoria is a biopic of Queen Victoria. Oh, okay. Yeah, since when, in the actual real life of Queen Victoria, did somebody called Wu Chow ever try to kill her and her entire family? Okay, fair enough. I was just thinking I remember an assassination attempt from that film. Just shows how well I remember that film. Um, it was Shanghai Nights. Shanghai Nights. Not okay. to be confused with Victoria. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, Shame on me. Yeah, in 1897, Count Dracula is en route from Varma to London via the Demeter. And that was from the film Dracula. Uh, 1901, Edward Cullen is born. What film, Dave? Oh, Twilight. It is. Oh, dear. The fact you got that is quite tragic. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just drowning in shame here. Uh, 1907, June 20th, 1907, Elijah P. Rogers is born. Elijah P. Rogers? Who's that? Uh, that's from Kick-Ass 2. Kick-Ass 2? No, I don't remember his name. Anyway, this is one that you possibly should get because you've got this kind of logic in your head and knowledge. Uh, June the 20th, 1956. Whilst on morning patrol, a French policeman is stabbed in the throat and robbed of his pistol. An hour later, a police station is ambushed by locals and two more officers are killed. By the afternoon, the streets are openly menaced by automatic weapon fire between rebel factions and the Territorial Guard. I have absolutely no idea. See, the reason why I thought you'd get that is because I know you've got quite a historian's head on your shoulders. Uh, that was the Battle of Algiers. Okay, all right, yeah, okay. No, I didn't know that one. Um, 2008. Millions try to leave Scotland, but the military and a 30-foot fence keep them in to isolate the deadly virus. Oh, goodness, I've watched this. It's bloody awful. Um... Yeah, it's some movie where she has some crazy robot sky, I think, as well. Yeah, it's Doomsday. Doomsday, yeah, it's rubbish. Sorry. And finally, on June the 20th in 2010, Guy's Choice premieres on Spike TV. Guy's Choice? I haven't seen that either. I'm trying. Uh, it's The Smurfs. The Smurfs, okay. Right. Uh, and that was meh, just movie events through history. So we are coming towards the end of another episode of World of Stew, which means it's time for me to hand over to my good buddy, it's Dave's A Week of Geek. This week of geek. This geeky week. 
This week, Geek Geek. This week, Geek Geek. already but as a balance this week um as i knew i was going to watch money in, uh, money in the bank event uh today i thought you know what i saw a great promo recently on the internet of matt hardy and jeff hardy and they're gonna have a they were gonna have a big match so i thought you know what i'll find that match to watch as well just to see you know what these what kind of match these seasoned veterans can pull off this of course was tna slammiversary it was TNA Slammiversary. It was Matt Hardy versus Jeff Hardy. Matt Hardy having been playing mind games with Jeff for seemingly weeks or months now by pretending to be this Willow character. Wasn't this a Full Metal Mayhem match? I, I'd heard it was described as a Full Metal Mayhem match, but when they came down to the ring, they just said it was a Fool's Count Anywhere match. Okay. Which they didn't seem to really use. And um, yet... Yeah, it was a really average match. It just reminded me why these two guys shouldn't be in WWE. They haven't improved with age. They haven't adjusted their style like some wrestlers should do as they get older. You look at someone like Chris Jericho. Uh, as a wrestler, he's matured as he gets older. He doesn't do as much of the high-flying stuff anymore. He's a bit... He's, in-ring style has slowed down. He doesn't do, he doesn't rely on the big stunts to finish his matches. And it just shows for me that Jeff Hardy and Matt Hardy, you know, lay off a drink, guys. Maybe lay off the food as well. Who knows? Uh, can uh, can help stop stop smoking stuff. And just, allegedly, allegedly, yeah. From what I hear, but um. Yeah, it's just a shame. You know, these guys were such big times, and I, I used to like them when they were a great tag team back in the early 90s, or late 90s, whichever it was. And it's just a shame to watch these guys kind of slowly deteriorating their career in TNA. Either way, uh, comics this week, I just read DC Comics 934. I thought I'd give it a try. Right. As, as part of DC Comics Rebirth, they have... This sounds a bit weird, but they have relaunched all their comics, apart from DC Comics and Action Comics, which are carrying on from the issue they last had before the New 52. Is that right, Stu? It is, yeah. I think so. So this was DC Comics 934. As we've alluded to earlier on, um, it, this issue is basically Batman one realising there's a new threat, so he wanders around Gotham, collecting up new sidekicks, including, bizarrely, Batwoman, and Clayface. Clayface is now working for Batman. Um, one thing I found really annoying in this issue, actually, the art was okay, the script writing was okay, I was a bit kind of annoyed at, you know, who are these guys? I don't want to read a book of sidekicks. So many adverts in this issue for DC Rebirth issues, and DC don't normally do that. So I hope they're not going to go the route that Marvel have recently of have just plastering so many adverts in their comics that just really distracts from it. It's just a little thing, but I found it annoying. Either way, I'd give the comic about 7 out of 10. It's worth picking up, especially as, you know, give it another three years by my reckoning. They will be reaching the landmark 1,000 issue. So um, does this tie into the whole Doctor Manhattan thing? As far as I've noticed so far, it doesn't. As far as I've noticed, there's a bizarre part at the start of the issue, which I probably should have mentioned, actually. Azrael, if yeah, comic fans who know him, he posed as Batman way back in the Nightfall story, where Batman needed a replacement because he had his back broken by Bane. Um, Azrael is being hunted down. Uh, this guy, uh, seemingly, is Batman, who beats him with an inch of his life and then Batman turns up to say, who did this to you? Azrael looks up and goes, uh, you did. And it's like, okay, who is it? So, I don't know. 
theories? I don't know. Is it Batman? Is it someone else? Is it... Have they done the same as they did in uh, Superman recently by saying, oh, the new 52 Batman isn't really Batman. It's the old Batman. So are they going to have two Batman? It's probably Batman. just Clayface. It probably was just Clayface. Who knows? <laughs> but, uh, you know, where this is going to go, who knows? But... Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to pick up the next issue. It was interesting for just to try it for an issue. But do you know what, folks? DC's new comics, DC Rebirth, they're going to be pretty cheap. So if, it doesn't matter if you pick up one or two issues. Give them a try. If you don't like them, it's only two quid. You know? what, what's two quid at the end of the day? It's a lottery ticket, which you know, you're not going to get back. Unless uh, you win. Movies, movies this week, I tried Gods of Egypt. What was this like? Oh, you know what? I, it's been a long time since I've done this, but usually when I watch a film, I will sit down and I'll watch the whole film, or I'll watch half of it and I'll watch half of it next day, just as a point to kind of go, okay, this may go somewhere. But this, I watched the first 50 minutes. It was just so bad. It's astonishing. The CGI is just appalling, which is a shame because almost everything in the film is CGI. Uh, it's, I can see what... Uh, this was directed by Alex Proyas, uh, famous for his brilliant cult comic the movie Crow, and again, a dark sci-fi movie, Dark City, and iRobot, which is a passable sci-fi movie, but here it doesn't work on any level. It's just trying to make a film of the mythos of the Greek gods, so they've got... Uh, Set, Osiris, um, Ra, and for some bizarre reason, as the sun god Ra at the start, you've got Brian Brown. Um, you may remember him from going way back to movies like FX, The Art of Illusion, and Cocktail with Tom Cruise. Right, okay. And it's just an appalling piece of casting. You've got, you know, you've got one god who's Irish, you've got another god who's uh, Italian, you've got another god who's Australian, and you've got another another one who's Scottish. And, so, I, and then you've got a main character who's Egyptian, who's got a very posh English accent, don't you know? It's like, it really doesn't make any sense. So is this better or worse than Jupiter Ascended? Oh, uh, it's worse, I have to say, because at least Jupiter Ascending, you can look at it and go, okay, you know what, it's, it's a sci-fi movie, you're making your own thing, and the special effects were right in that, whereas this, it's like, you know what, if someone had made a film this bad about, let's say, um, the Christian, uh, the Christian religion, people would be up in arms, but because it's an old dead religion that people don't believe in anymore, it's okay to make this kind of try? Well, do I you don't know, think so. Do you know what um, Gods of Egypt global box office is? Oh, what is it? 142 million off of a budget of 140 million. <sighs> Youch. Um, uh, compared to Jupiter yeah. Ascending, which took 183 million off a budget of 176, so they're pretty much on the par. Yeah, pretty much on par. And you know what, that's the thing. Gerard Butler, he turns up in this as the Greek, as um, the ancient god Set. And he's alright. He's an alright actor. You can see he's doing an alright job, but he's got nothing to work with. He's just kind of standard bad guy. I don't know, he's been, in some, he's been in some pretty bad films recently, to be honest. He has been in some bad films. I just wonder, you know what, he's an alright actor. At what point does someone's career flip? and they become unbankable. Well, you know what, he's a guy from Scotland, he's probably just happy to be taking those paychecks for 20, 30 million quid, isn't he, let's be honest. Well, if you thought that was bad, wait till you see Knock Knock. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, I do have to watch that this week. I shall write this down, write that down to remind myself. Also, just quickly this week, uh, if you're on Xbox, as I am, you might want to try out the Halo Wars 2 uh, beta, which I've been trying out this week. I do love my kind of real-time strategy games and there's not enough of them on uh, on Xbox and on, on console in general actually but this is a pretty good one you know you're an alien army or you're a human army in the future build an army take 
play against people online, so set your army against theirs. It's great fun. And my youngest, Sam, he really enjoys it as well. So it's clearly not just playable for adults, it's playable for kids as well. And it's a beta test, so it's free. Uh, also, just briefly, one last very little piece of news. I know we don't normally mention stuff like this, but very glad to see Tim Peake make it back from space safely. The UK's first astronaut making it back to Earth safely. Uh, seeing the kids in school today just interested and in talking about space and infused about real life space travel is, you know, possibly the greatest geek thing you can accomplish in your life. And Tim Peake has done that for children in the UK. So good on him and glad to see him safe back. Uh, I think he's in Kazakhstan still at the moment, but hopefully he'll be back in the UK soon. Speaking of uh, video games, as you did there, obviously it was Father's Day yesterday. It uh, was indeed. Uh, what did you get for Father's Day? Um, I got, um, this will make you laugh, actually, I got a Total Film magazine. Right. I got breakfast in bed. And uh, this was actually the first Father's Day. I haven't worked for like three years. Um, so it was actually delightful to get a line and a cup of tea and breakfast in bed. But I... Uh, as well as my film magazine, I also got a um, a raspberry vodka cocktail, which I put in the frid, put in the freezer and turn it into a kind of nice slushy. And that is because the kids know me well as no, an alcoholic. No, 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 by any means, as a girl drink drunk. That is you. I will. I will. You know. I will go with that. That you do drink girls' drinks. Yeah, you do know me too well, obviously. Either. Yeah, I do drink the girls. Do like not being sexist, but girls' drinks. And it was from a comedy sketch by a 90s comedy group called The Kids in the Hall. Now, if you look it up on YouTube, Kids in the Hall, Girl Drink Drunk. Okay? It's a little comedy scene where a guy is just addicted to girl drinks. And it's a little bit funny. It's, you know, obviously I'm not the kind of guy who will hide in a cupboard and might myself make myself a cocktail just to just so I can wake up in the morning, but, you know, that's how kids know me. Well, the reason why I mentioned it was because my Father's Day present was an N64. Oh, cool. Right. Um, and with this N64, there was a couple of games. There was Banjo-Kazooie, uh, 1080, Snowboarding. Do you remember the, back in the day when we used to play that? Yeah, I do. 1080, 1080 Skateboarding was fun. Snowboarding day. Snowboarding, sorry. Snowboarding yeah. was fun. Um, and Mario 64. Right. Yeah, I've never played Mario 64 so much. Yeah, obviously it's a classic game, but Banjo Kazooie as well. If you can get the girls to try and complete that, that was a cool game. Well, funny you should mention that because obviously I've got um, daughters who are age seven and ten. Now Mega New Seven isn't really that bothered, but Jesse really wanted to play. Right. So obviously I banged it on and I was playing Mario 64 and I was loving it. And she then wanted to go, so I gave her the controller. Her first comments were, what the hell is this controller? How am I supposed to hold this? Right? Right. She then played the game and went, this is so ridiculously hard. And she was on the very first level. And I'm like, this isn't hard. This is awesome. This is like the greatest video game of all time. You kids do not know. Take your Minecraft and shove it. This is amazing. This is the thing, if you put me on Minecraft, I'd be like, okay, what the hell am I doing? What's all this 200 items in my inventory? How do I make this into this? But, you know, they know that, so we can get to grips with Banjo-Kazooie. It's just a different kind of... You have... Just the same Mario, don't you? You have to... It's about reactions, it's about timing. And I seem to um, remember you had a particularly passionate love affair with Goldeneye. I did, and I believe I mentioned... Did I mention it briefly a couple of months ago when I went to the Games Festival Insomnia? Uh, I had the kids, I had my kids, sit down in front of a TV playing Goldeneye, and as the same as yours did, they picked up the Nintendo 64 controller, they looked at it, they held it in their hands for a moment, trying out different ways to hold it. They're like, what are we supposed to do with this? How do we hold it? <laughs> Until I said, right guys, no, your left hand in the middle, your right hand on the other side, and you do it like this. And they're like, uh, and then I kind of said, right, guys, look, this is games history, okay? Nintendo invented the rumble pad. They also invented this little stick in the middle of the controller and the trigger. 
they were the first ones to do that, okay? Like, it's like, right, okay. But like, yeah, it's boring to them, but to me and you it's history, right? Anyway, this inspired two things. First of all, it's inspired me to want to buy as many retro consoles as possible. Um, but it was also inspired me for next week's top 10, which will be the World of Stew top 10 all-time video games. All-time video games, seriously? Which means I want five from you, five from me, and that will be next week's top 10. Oh, that is going to be a challenge, man. Seriously. So I already know what my number one choice is going to be. We've already mentioned it, but we'll skip over that for now. So, Dave, that is your mission for the next week, to come up with your top five all-time video games. And we should just point out that this won't be the necessarily the top ten video games of all time as per, you know, the uh, video game press. This is mine and Dave's. It's the World of Stew top ten all-time video games. <laughs> So before we finish this week's show, we've got time to do some housekeeping. You can, of course, check us out on our official website, which is silentmovieman.wix.com forward slash world of stew. We have some blog posts up there. We update those every now and again. It also has every single episode of this show on that website. Um, And I will be posting a new blog post about a film that I watched the other day, Popstar, Never Stop Stopping, which we'll talk about more next week. Um, you can also. Oh, I'm guessing you didn't watch that voluntarily. No, I did actually. I thought I'd give it a go. Okay. So, and you'll be you'll be surprised by my reaction. <laughs> okay, that's yeah. I look forward to that next week then. Yeah. Um, you can also check out the official World of Stew artist who created the pictures that you see on the website and also on our Facebook page. That is Gary Smith, who creates his art at the Folk Art of Cactus County. Do yourself a favour. Go onto his website, which. I think it's an Etsy shop, uh, E-T-S-Y. Look for the Folk Art of Cactus County and buy yourself a painting because they are awesome. Uh, We are also part of the Pancast Productions Network. Just go to pancast.co.uk. Pavo and Neil, who are the masterminds behind Pancast, they have brought together lots of different podcasts from various different people, lots of different shows, and it's all part of some glorious network. Finally, you can catch us on the Sobel Nation. Um, well, it's part of the Sobel Nation. It's Movie Utopia. Just go to broadwayutopia.fm. You'll see a little link on there to click Movie Utopia. We will appear on there in America at uh, 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time every Saturday night, which is 2 o'clock Sunday morning in British money. And finally, Dave, because there's so much... Uh, you can find us on our YouTube channel, which I've updated. I should have to have a look at it, because I haven't found it yet. Right, um, just go to YouTube, type in World of Stew, um, and you should find us. Do not confuse us, however, with the wonderful World of Stew, um, which, if you look at Wonderful World of Stew, you'll understand why, because it's completely not this show. Um, I can't look that up as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with the Wonderful World of Stew, it's just not us. So we always finish the show with a song which normally relates to something that's gone in the show before. But this week I want to do something slightly different. Right. Okay, that's what I'm going to do uh, This week there's another death that you may not have realised. Uh, Prince B, have you ever heard of him? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, no, well he passed away. Uh, he wasn't very old either um, due to complications surrounding his diabetes. Uh, you might not have heard of Prince B, but you may have heard of the group that he was in. They were called PM Dawn. Oh, yes, I know PM Dawn. Yeah. Um, their biggest hit, of course, was Set Adrift on Memory Bliss. They had, I think it was four albums. The first two were big smashes. Albums three and four kind of died on their ass. Anyway, I love Set Adrift on Memory Bliss. I just think it's a great song. It samples uh, Spandau Ballet's True, and I want to finish... If you'll permit me, Dave, with that song this week. Absolutely. So, in memory of Prince B, we are going to finish with Set Adrift on Memory Bliss. Just leaves me enough time to say thank you, everyone, for listening. And thank you once again, Dave. Always fun, always welcome. And until next week, a keep it geek.